So hi everyone, I'm Natalie Irwin, Director of Stakeholder Engagement here at Efficiency Canada. Welcome back to another Friday discovery session. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so for those that are new, we ask that you save your questions to the end. We have a 20 minute allotment for questions, so we have lots of time to for some great discussion. Um, so after we hear from our guests, a reminder that we do have a pretty hard stop at 1245 Eastern time so that everyone uh, still has time to uh, last minute lunch or breakfast um, things, depending on where you are in Canada. Uh, and then, so please join me in welcoming uh, Ian McVeigh from Manager of Sustainability uh, at Regional Municipality of Durham and Lauren McNutt with Dunsky Energy Consulting, who will be speaking to the role of municipal financing programs and accelerating climate action. Welcome, Ian and Lauren. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be Thank here. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Okay, so we'll jump right in. Um, okay, welcome everyone. Good day. Um, so I'm going to start things off. Uh, I'll talk about sustainable financing uh, with respect to, to municipalities and then uh, just talk generally about this and then uh, uh, lead into kind of the work that we were doing uh, to help support the region of Durham and then I'll hand it over to Ian uh, to talk in detail about the, the program we help to support. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Dunsky Energy Consulting, um, we are a, a small firm um, uh, with offices in Montreal and Toronto. Um, we specialize in energy efficiency, renewable energy and mobility. Um, and within those areas of expertise, we offer three services. So we help uh, our clients identify opportunities, design strategies, plans and programs. We skip over implementation altogether, but we can come back into the fold to help evaluate program performance and, and the impact that uh, these programs are having. And our clients are mainly um, all levels of government, utilities and, and businesses and nonprofits. And as you can see by the map here, um, we, we have clients all over North America. Um, so I'm just going to start off with um, why pursuing, why, why pursue sustainable financing, um, what financing mechanisms are available, why should municipalities be involved? And then how we applied this knowledge um, to, to the Durham project. And then, as I said, I'll hand it over to Ian to briefly introduce the Durham region. Um, the community energy plan was the impetus for the program and uh, the deep energy retrofit program design. So um, why pursue sustainable financing? Um, it's, it's becoming an increasingly popular and a effective tool to support the adoption of energy efficiency upgrades and renewable technologies in the building sector. Um, it can certainly help to, by improving the energy efficiency of buildings, it can help meet uh, greenhouse gas emissions targets. Um, it's becoming, it, it's really helping increase the number of upgrades undertaken by helping to reduce the upfront cost barrier for building owners who may be unable to access capital for, for projects from traditional financial institutions um, and certain types of financing can also help overcome the split incentive barriers um, by attaching financing to the property rather than an individual which can allow for transferability and, and of payments and benefits and financing can be complementary to existing incentives and, and policies and, and the most successful financing programs do that um, every province has some form of incentive for efficiency um, it can in improve the attractiveness of efficiency upgrades, reduce the amount that uh, building owners have to borrow, and that uh, combined with financing can provide that capital needed for building owners, owners to actually take action. And of course, investing in efficiency will help support multiple municipal objectives, like improving the building stock, affordability, uh, local economic growth. And, and efficiency financing programs run the gamut. Uh, there's a number of different building types that are eligible under various different programs as well as different eligible measures. Um, there are numerous financing mechanisms that are available. Um, property assessed clean energy or PACE tends to be the first thing people think about with respect to municipal financing but there are many others to consider and there are various factors that um, are going to ultimately determine what financing mechanism is, is most appropriate. And of course, each comes with their own benefits and trade-offs. Um, there's traditional consumer loans, that's your private personal loan, credit cards, um, uh, a line of credit. They're, they're widely available, but you know, they're not necessarily targeted at energy efficiency or renewable energy, um, unless uh, a financial institution is partnering with a, a municipality or, or a, a DSM program administrator. 
Um, then you've got interest rate buy downs. Um, this is essentially where the government subsidizes the interest rate on private loans um, to encourage uptake of energy efficiency. Um, because interest rate charges do accrue significantly over time, these can be very expensive uh, options uh, for longer term lending. So they tend to commonly be applied over short or medium term loans, like five to seven years. Then you've got on-bill um, programs. Um, this is essentially where the upfront cost of, of energy efficiency or renewable energy upgrades are covered by the utility or a third party financier and then repaid through the utility bill. Um, it's, it's kind of this elegant solution. Um, it offers simplicity and convenience of, of one, one bill and it does increase the transparency. So um, building owners can actually see the savings as well as the repayment on the same bill. Uh, and there's essentially two types. On-bill financing is where the utility incurs the cost um, and on-bill repayment where there's actually a third party, um, uh, single or multiple lenders involved, uh, not the utility, but the, the repayment mechanism is essentially the same. Um, it does, um, it may require some legislation to allow utilities to do that. Um, there are two potential issues with on-bill um, to be aware of. Um, the billing system may require complex or, or costly changes to utility billing system to allow for this. And then there's a question of repayment allocation, essentially when a, a customer might partially pay for the bill. So when using a third party source of capital, um, the utility typically um, receives the gas or electric charge first, and that may increase the risk to the lender. So for these types of programs, um, it may benefit by having a credit enhancement to attract private capital and reduce the risk. And then we've got, uh, of course, PACE property assessed clean energy. Um, uh, in Canada, they're, they're uh, often referred to as local improvement charge. And this is where a special property tax is applied to the property. It offers access to long-term financing with a fixed interest rate, provides financing uh, secured by a tax lien on the property. And it's typically repaid through the property tax bill and can allow for relaxed underwriting. It does require enabling legislation and the municipality must act and enact a bylaw. And there are only four, um, three provinces and one territory that currently have enabling legislation. That's not, uh, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Alberta, and the Yukon. And then lastly, we have pay as you saves. Um, and these are typically repaid through the utility bill. So it is a, a type of on bill uh, mechanism. Um, but um, the golden rule is that the energy savings generated from the home up, uh, building upgrades have to have a savings to investment ratio of greater than one. So it's very prescriptive, restrictive in the types of measures that are included and the savings must be equal to or greater than the cost of the repayment terms. Um, so why should municipalities be involved? Um, there is significant opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. Um, over 400 municipalities have declared a climate emergency um, and municipalities have set pretty significant um, or ambitious GHG emissions targets. Um, and, and buildings can certainly help to, to achieve those goals. And you know, when we think about buildings, the government of Canada has forecast that 75% of the building stock will still be in use by 2030. So it's a, a very important segment of the uh, the sector that needs to be addressed. Um, investing in efficiency supports, as I mentioned already at the beginning, other municipal goals, improving the building stock, affordability, local economic growth. And I think in the age of COVID, community health and safety is of course top of mind. Um, and municipalities have a, a, a deep, close relationship with their constituents. They're, they're viewed as a trusted source. And I think there's a number of municipal tools that um, uh, that municipalities have access to that can complement financing um, and, and, and further its impact. And now is an opportune time to get involved. Um, there, there are a number of national initiatives to help support municipalities with financing. We've got the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Community Efficiency Financing Stream. Um, and, and the idea is to help support municipalities uh, deliver new innovative financing programs, um, as well as um, supporting the expansion of existing programs. And there's quite generous loans, or sorry, grants, uh, as well as loans and, and um, credit enhancement through a, a partial loan guarantee for municipalities and their partners. And then we've got the Canada Infrastructure Bank. We, they just recently announced uh, plans to invest uh, $10 billion in new major infrastructure initiatives of which $2 billion have been earmarked to invest in large scale building energy retrofits. And then um, I'm going to, uh, 
Ian's going to get into quite a bit of detail, but I'll just give you an overview of how we kind of took all of this information and knowledge around financing and applied it to the Durham project. So um, this, this project, we were uh, worked with Durham to help support the, them to design a, that one of a, their key initiatives in the Durham Community Energy Plan, which is a, a residential deep energy retrofit program. Um, and the program aims to retrofit 98% of homes by 2050. So it's a pretty ambitious goal. And the Community Energy Plan had actually assumed a local improvement charge would be one of several levers that would be uh, deployed to help homeowners complete retrofits. Um, so we took all of this financing knowledge I gave you a very high level uh, overview of. Um, we, we modeled and forecasted the adoption and, and the impacts that would be um, achieved over a number of different scenarios. Um, we conducted, I, I would say, very meaningful collaborative engagement. Um, Durham was uh, formed a, a steering committee, which we engaged throughout the process. We did key industry stakeholder engage, we sorry, engaged key industry stakeholders, and uh, we helped support homeowner focus groups. And then we applied this best practice in, in program design. Um, we know financing is one tool, um, but it is not the only tool. And, and uh, I think to be most effective, it needs to be integrated into a, a broader energy efficiency ecosystem. Um, we needed to align with the project goals, program goals, and, and the processes need to be streamlined for participants. Um, and out of all of that work, um, what we ultimately found was that an OBR and third party financing was, was really, um, a preferred alternative to an LIC and, and, and offer this opportunity to leverage private sector capital. Um, as I mentioned, financing must be integrated into a wider energy efficiency ecosystem. So a full service delivery experience is really needed. So the program is going to include a strong marketing and awareness campaign. It maximizes coordination and collaboration with um, key market actors and existing programs. Um, and the cornerstone of the program includes this high touch energy coach service that's going to help homeowners throughout the renovation journey. And then it needs to have a long-term approach. So through the homeowner focus groups, we really heard that homeowners prefer a staged approach over five to 10 years. Most are not willing or able to take on large retrofits all at once. So um, throughout the process, homeowners will actually um, have uh, a home energy roadmap developed to help them stage retrofits so that Durham can ultimately achieve their deep retrofit goal by 2050. And throughout this process, we really wanted to help Durham um, hopefully be able to access CEF funding. So the application is in um, and, uh, you know, hopefully take advantage of some of the generous grants and the partial loan guarantee to help offset the risk uh, for, for finance part, financial partners. So I ran through that very quickly. Um, I'm going to hand this over to, to Ian um, and uh, you can get into the details of the program. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, happy to be here to share a bit uh, of what Durham Region is working on with our residential energy uh, retrofit pr program. Uh, so Ian McVeigh, uh, Manager of Sustainability in the CAO's office. I joined the region about a year ago. Um, and was given a mandate really of relentless implementation was the quote from my CAO, re relentless implementation of our uh, climate change plans, including the Durham Community Energy Plan. Uh, so that's what I've been doing uh, to, the, to the extent that I've been able in the, in the year plus that I've been in the role um, and really approaching this as sort of a, a very much from a partnership orientation, working in, in, uh, in collaboration with many stakeholders across the region. Um, so I'll just start with a bit of a brief intro to Durham region. So we are a, an upper tier. Um, sorry, I just had a call coming in, which I will decline. Sorry about that. Um, um, we are an upper tier municipality. We have eight local area municipalities within our within our boundaries. Um, I think what's unique about us is is one very much a urban rural context. So we have in in the south near near Lake Ontario very much urban industrialized uh, municipalities, and in the north very much agricultural rural areas. Also very diverse politically. So our MPs, MPPs, municipal councillors span the political spectrum from you know, NDP, Green to uh, Liberal and, and Conservative, which I think is, you know, presents unique challenges and, and opportunities in terms of getting uh, buy-in at the political level for uh, climate action pr programs. Uh, we're also from a population perspective, uh, currently at about 650,000 people, but expected to grow to over 1 million people by 2041. So a lot of new development is, is planned within the region, which, you know, as you can imagine, poses some big challenges for us meeting our uh, long-term greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. 
Um, so uh, back in, I think through 20, 2016 to 2018, before I, I, I started, um, we, we did a, an in-depth uh, community-wide uh, energy plan and analysis, which looked at the most cost-effective way to meet our uh, long-term greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And what you can see here in this chart really is that it's a story of uh, transportation and residential buildings. So the green wedge and the dark blue wedge uh, are the ones that decline most significantly over over the coming decades in order for us to meet meet our meet our targets. This is obviously, I think, quite similar to most municipalities across Ontario and 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 Canada, uh, particularly those that don't have a significantly kind of heavy in, uh, uh, industrial base. Um, so that's kind of where we're focusing. And and when we look at the priority implementation programs that emerge from the Durham Community Energy Plan, uh, that's that's kind of where you see the focus. So the the Durham Green Standard on uh, the first one is really looking at new development and um, how we can encourage uh, above code, net zero building. Uh, uh, the deep retrofit program, which I'll focus on um, more 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 in depth in this pr pr presentation. Uh, as well as others looking at uh, tr 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 transportation. So I'm not going to go in depth here, but really focus on the deep retrofit program. Um, so we really kicked this off, process off uh, at the beginning of this year. And I should, I need to stay, uh, stay up front that we haven't yet implemented this program. So uh, um, we're, we're, we're hopeful that uh, we can align the funding to, 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 to launch this program next year. But we did, did a whole lot of work in a short time uh, to get to pull together the stakeholders and rally everyone around the concept that I'm going to share with you here. Uh, so we started, as I said, in January 2020, established a, a, a program steering committee with representation from our local area municipalities, from our local energy utilities, both on the electric and the gas side, uh, nonprofit uh, organizations, uh, uh, the Atmospheric Fund, which I should mention provided a, a, an early stage concept development grant. Um, and we're happy to be supported by Lauren and the Dunsky team, as well as uh, uh, the uh, Sustainable Technology Evaluation Program uh, out of the Toronto Region C Conservation Authority. Um, so we established that retrofit steering committee, which was really important to bring the people around the table that we needed to get buy-in for collaborative implementation. So the region, one as an upper tier municipality and, and just as a municipality in general can't do it all on its own. And so working in collaboration with our utility partners is, was, you know, was seen as, as uh, really critical. Um, so the, the Dunsky team helped us with the, with the market analysis that, that Lawrence spoke about. We had both a quantitative assessment of our um, residential building stock um, uh, to, to validate the focus on single family homes built uh, in the sort of before 1970 to, 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 to 2000 basis in terms of the number of dwellings within that time frame. And then we did the quality, qualitative assessment where we interviewed stakeholders, including skilled trades, materials, suppliers. Um, uh, we did the ho homeowner focus groups really to try, try to explore and validate our, our preliminary uh, theory of change for, for, the, for the program, which then led to uh, a the, the development of our, our market interventions and program theory of change, which I'll talk, talk more about uh, in, the, in the slides that follow, leading to uh, getting stakeholder and, and council support in the middle of the year, which enabled us to submit our uh, funding application to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities uh, in, in about the uh, middle of the year. Um, and we've been continuing on with some more detailed program implementation planning since then, and I'll talk about some of the some of what that looks like and some of the questions that we're, uh, that we're kind of still grappling with as, as we gear up for that implementation next year. Um, so when we look at the homeowner barrier, so we did the focus groups and explored, you know, we came in with the theory that really financing was the, was the critical barrier. Um, but actually what we heard didn't support that. And so what we heard really was, yes, financing is, is, a, is an issue, but more important is lack of energy literacy and awareness and just the overall complexity of applying for existing efficiency programs, of working with contractors, aligning rebates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so that really gave us uh, a lot of food for thought around how we structure our program and where, and where we put the emphasis uh, in terms of the market interventions that we were going to uh, apply. I'm, are you, you're following, you're, you're following along. Thanks, Lauren. I, I didn't ask, actually ask you to change slides, but you're along with me. Uh, that's great. Uh, can you change the slide? <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I just assumed because I was looking at my deck on my own computer and I was hitting slide and I just forgot that I wasn't sharing my screen. So anyways, that happens. Um, so here's our conceptual model. Um, so the so basically from the financing perspective, what we decided was that we wanted to work with local private sector partners to to act to provide um, provide retrofit capital. Um, so we, we aligned with uh, a, a local electric, uh, electricity utility, namely um, Oshawa Power and Utilities Corp, uh, who agreed uh, to, to consider offering an on-bill financing offer, uh, as well as some, some local credit unions uh, in the rest of the region, uh, who, who again indicated a willingness to offer some preferential loan terms for retrofit projects. And so, so what the region is, pro is proposing to do is to offer a loan guarantee or loan loss reserve, uh, which enables those, those lending partners, both the utility and the credit unions, to, um, again, offer those preferred terms, recognizing that they're not holding the bag or holding all of, all of the risk in the, in the event of a default. And so by sort of outsourcing the financing to local partners for whom this is their business, uh, that is financing, it enabled the region really to focus on the other barriers that actually emerged as being potentially more uh, significant. And so what we're working on is really trying to design this home energy coach service or home energy co concierge service that's uh, going to be established and set up to really support the homeowner throughout the uh, home upgrade process. So we're going to connect them um, with an Energuide auditor, help them review the audit, connect with local trades uh, through partnership with the Durham Region Home Builders Association, uh, connect with our financing partners, and really just try to be that kind of trusted friend partner throughout the whole process so the homeowner feels like they have a, um, an, an unbiased expert support throughout the whole process of, of, of completing a, a, a retrofit. Um, I think next slide. Um, so in terms of making the case to council, I mentioned before, you know, the, the, the wide diversity of, of political orientation. And so it was really critical for us to articulate the program objectives and outcomes in a sort of triple bottom line, uh, environment, economy, and uh, um, uh, what's it, social, social benefits. And so um, that's what you see here. This is a really central part of our, our council report and, and, uh, and, uh, and sort of value pr pr proposition. Uh, and so you can see in the first four years, we're really looking at trying to drive about a thousand uh, home energy retrofit projects, um, um, leading to job creation, economic growth, et cetera, et cetera. And so again, this this was really central. We actually ended up getting uh, unanimous council support uh, when we went uh, when we went for it in uh, in June. Um, so in terms of what success looks like, of course, a thousand homes is fairly small in the context of retrofitting all homes across the region. We have two hundred thousand single family homes now. Uh, and of course, more to come as the population growth uh, uh, happens. Um, and so success is in a thousand homes, really success is really putting in place the, the conditions for market transformation that enable us to scale uh, over the next several decades. So what we're defining success is really creating a pool of qualified home energy performance contractors that can help to deliver these projects over time, bringing in a, enough capital, both public and private sector capital to, to, to meet demand. And then finally, de designing a delivery platform that is gonna help mobilize homeowner demand. And so we're looking at this delivery platform as being both a digital data-driven solution, but as well a, so a high tech kind of piece, but also a high touch uh, homeowner engagement on the phone or in person, if, if that is ever possible again, or when that's possible again, uh, to really provide that trusted one-on-one uh, -on -one support that a, uh, an algorithm can't provide. Um, so that's kind of what we're working on now. I think that's really my next, no, I'll, I'll go to the next slide, but I'll talk more about that delivery platform uh, a bit later. Um, so in terms of program evolution, I talked about, you know, the, you know, we're focusing on energy now, but we really want to look over time to expand this into other aspects of home, home energy improvement from an environmental perspective. So water efficiency, stormwater management, green roofs, but also looking to expand the program into other building sector segments, rental housing, multi-unit residential and commercial. Um, next slide, please. Um, as we move forward, I think one of the key questions that is really today over the past little while that we've been grappling with is what this home energy coach platform looks like and what's the appropriate balance between this 
algor algorithmic, is that a word, uh, data-driven, you know, machine learning kind of approach versus more of a on the ground, high touch, you know, on the phone, you know, at farmer's markets, you know, that whole kind of local flavor uh, that I think is really important for people. So what's the right balance and recognizing we have limited resources, how do we structure uh, a, a say an RFP in a way that's going to get us the appropriate balance of these of these two. That's a that's a question I don't have the answer for. Um, Lauren, myself, and uh, the, the the sustainable technology evaluation program team are trying to work on that right now. Uh, social equity and inclusion, I must admit, is a little bit of a gap in our program design at this point. We are focused on owner-occupied single-family homes, so you own a home, you tend to be a bit more wealthy. Um, and so, but also from the supply side, we recognize that skilled trades, there are, there are real barriers to accessing that, uh, that career path, both from a racial equity, but also a gender equity perspective. And so I think this is something that I, I recognize as a gap. And I think as we evolve the program over time, we'll need to think about how we, how we evolve it in a way that's, that's actually recognizing some of these, some of these uh, uh, important issues. So thoughts or questions on that would be, uh, I'd be uh, happy to hear them and discuss that. And then the longer term program sustainability. So assuming we are successful with FCM's community efficiency financing, which of course is not guaranteed, uh, that's a four or four year grant. Um, and so how do we, and recognizing we have a, a 2050 ambition, how do we, how do we sustain this program over time? I have some theories around that, around delivering value to utilities, around delivering value to the skilled trades, and perhaps trying to monetize some of that value to support the program platform over time. But that's not figured out yet. So we're looking to launch and, and demonstrate the value and, and bring others alongside to, to iterate the program over time. I think that's all I got. I don't know how long I was, sorry. But I uh, hope that was valuable and interesting. And uh, I'll uh, look forward to the questions and discussion. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ian and Lauren. That was, I can, I can answer your question of yes, that was definitely valuable and, and interesting. <laughs> okay. There's a, a lot of information, a lot of details there. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. My um, pleasure. So we're just going to jump into questions here. Just a reminder, there are two ways to ask questions. One is you can type in the Q&A box, which is the bottom of your Zoom screen. And the second way is just to raise your hand and Zoom and I can unmute you to ask your question yourself. Uh, the only role we have is actually the same that we have for all our presenters as well, which is no sales pitches, please. And uh, no statements uh, posed or disguised as questions. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to jump in. Actually, Ian, you were talking about um, the role of trades just now. So I just want to jump to this question we have from Tanya here is, what is the role of the building industry, so like trades associations, etc., in supporting these financing programs? So Ian or Lauren can answer that one. Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um... Well, Lauren, I can, do you want to? Yeah, give, I can you have start it, maybe. Sure. Um, well, I, I mean, trades, I think, play an incredibly important role. Like retrofit contractors are going to be critical. They're the ones that homeowners, I think, you know, pick up the phone when something breaks. Um, they're they are a, a resource that they're going to go to when they they need to have something um, installed or upgraded. Um, we've seen in other financing programs, um, contractors can play a critical role in just extending the, the marketing and outreach to, to homeowners, but what they also need is the support and the training that's necessary to do that. Um, California, um, the Hero Pace program does have issues, but from a uptake perspective, um, it was very, very successful, and it was because there was this real effort to train and support contractors in, in helping to essentially close the deal at the kitchen table. And I think maybe when we think about trade associations, collaborating with them, making sure that we use their network to engage contractors, provide the necessary training on the program, and then also making too that there's these trades are are properly skilled, qualified, have the necessary certification to, to add that trust um, perspective to for, for homeowners. Yeah, I think I just I re uh, reiterate that th we do see them as an important sales channel, and so the extent that they can sell this as a package that includes financing uh, is going to be helpful to give the homeowner comfort that they're not, you know, they're not going to be putting themselves on the line f financially. But then I think, yeah, the other point that just to reinforce is the importance of working with 
um, you know, highly qualified skilled trades to give our financing partners comfort that they're not taking an undue risk that they're that the homeowner is working with someone that's bonded insured and you know certified to, to deliver the types of projects that are being scoped is going to provide the financing partners with comfort that you know the energy savings will be realized and uh, and, and and whatnot so I, I think that's maybe just reinforce Lauren's response there yeah and I'll also add to that like what can they do in, in supporting financing programs I know we work with like at efficiency Canada we work with a number of um, organizations or trade associations like HRAI sustainable buildings Canada ASHRAE uh, and just giving feedback to governments and policymakers who are the ones that are making the decisions on if the financing pro what the financing program is mm -hmm. um, if it's going to exist or going to continue uh, or be created so that's a big a big piece that they have to play in supporting that that is existing just like just talking to their elected officials uh, on that saying that yeah this does matter to our industry so that's a role that they play as well uh, a question here from Krim is uh, should financing programs optimize for greenhouse gas savings uh, or energy bill savings and just a statement or his thoughts on that is if households are to take on debt against future savings, greenhouse gas optimizations of upgrades may do little to energy bills and in some cases increase bills, for example, heat pumps and like electrification, uh, which is detrimental to the lower income home. So I can ask the question, so should financing programs optimize greenhouse gas savings or energy bills? In your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a it's a loaded question. Yeah. Um, a good one. Uh, I mean, yeah. we grappled with this too, in the sense we were initially thinking of putting a uh, uh, savings to investment ratio criterion on our financing program to essentially say that the uh, energy savings uh, uh, needed to be equal to the monthly uh, loan payment, uh, so that the there was a, a, ca a, a cash flow. It was a cash flow neutral or positive, but again, here to the point, then that that kind of put out a whole bunch of retrofits that were actually more impactful from a from a GHG savings perspective. So uh, we got rid of that criterion, and uh, and instead, in our what we're proposing to do is actually create some financing incentives for electrification measures to help shift the um, the ROI, I guess. So we're looking at a heat pump. Uh, a, a cash rebate incentive, uh, which currently isn't available in the Ontario market. Uh, we're looking at a rebate for level two EV charging infrastructure in the home, which again, isn't currently there. Um, so that's kind of how we're approaching it. I don't know, Lauren, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think you said it really well. I mean, this was something that we definitely struggled with. The last thing we want to do is increase costs to, to homeowners. Um, and, and there's this challenge with trying to focus on uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, and I think the, the only thing I would add is our, I think the intention with the program is likely to let's start with building envelope um, measures as well. I think there's definitely going to be a focus on that. But for those who want to take on some of those other uh, fuel switching measures, EVs, there's going to be that added incentive as, as Ian already mentioned. So it, yeah. it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I definitely. guess that's where the staging of retrofits come in. Yeah, that to Lauren's point that we're looking at thermal envelope really as the priority at first, not so much pushing electrification now because yeah, it it there's the at least in Ontario, it's different in other provinces, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and so the theory is on a 10-year roadmap that you know theoretically market prices for electricity and gas are going to change and enable the business case for HVAC conversions in over time but the focus right now at least the coach is going to be saying envelope first let's work on the envelope first get it get it up to speed and then and later iterations address some of the uh some of the other issues so this kind of leads into the other question you kind of somewhat answered it but i just want to ask the question in case you want to add to it is can you please comment on how hvac and water heating equipment played into a, a role of your retrofit activities and if it did yeah, so I mean, we're so we're aligning with Enbridge and uh, who offers currently has incentives in the market for uh, higher efficiency uh, gas gas um, equipment. And so, you know, we're, we're, we'll be encouraging uptake of those incentives. And then we're also creating our own 
Durham specific incentives for uh, uh, electrification measures. I mentioned the heat pump conversions and the, the EV charging stations. So that's, I don't, that's maybe not a full response to the question, but that's, that's what we're looking at. Right. I'm just going to, um, Dave, I'm going to allow you to talk here so you can ask your own question if you want to go ahead. Thanks and uh, congratulations, Ian. It's been great to watch you uh, evolve this program over the last while. You and many others of us have been talking about this stuff for years, so it's great to see someone closer to the start line. My Thanks, question, Dave. You're welcome. Yeah, it, my question is with regards to the on-bail repayment. I, I'm really intrigued by you leading with that program because arg arguably the evidence in Canada is that utilities and nonprofit organizations have been far more successful than municipal LIC programs for home energy retrofits to date. Mm -hmm. So how, can you elaborate a bit more on it, like an easy part, is it both electrical and natural gas utilities and how will it work if there's a number of measures that cross both those sort of distribution, like the electricity and natural gas divide and building on vote, how will that be consolidated into one bill repayment? Because they may be doing some fuel switching, they may be doing some insulation, they may do, be doing some furnace upgrades or other equipment upgrades. Uh, I understand through one of the gas utilities that they don't really do financing, but they allow a bill repayment for contractors and suppliers. So is there a consolidation of you, your utility on bill um, repayment? Yeah, I mean, so Oshawa Power, so in, in of our lo eight local area municipalities, the on-bill financing will be available in Oshawa uh, with the local credit union financing available in the rest of the region. So yeah, so in Oshawa, it would be one, one bill re repayment through Oshawa Power. Um, we did, there was some legal due diligence or, or policy analysis that we had to do on this because there is... Um, and Lauren would probably have more, more of the details closer to her mind, but the OEB rule or the rules around on-bill financing for electric utilities say that, that they can only finance measures that result in electricity conservation. Yeah. Um, and so we took a more, uh, maybe a liberal view on that in the sense that, you know, thermal envelope measures um, do indirectly address energy in the sense of, you know, your, your natural gas, your, your furnace fan is going to be operating less. <laughs> um, you know, uh, yeah, there, there, there will be, it's primarily gas savings, but there is an electrical component. Um, and so we, we did actually get some validation from the Ministry of Energy and the OEB that that interpretation was consistent with the, uh, the regulation as it's written. Um, so that's our justification that we're working with in terms of having the electric utility finance the, the being able to find, provide financing for uh, what, it, what might be traditionally considered gas savings, but it's actually more thermal envelope uh, improvements. Does that answer your question, Dave? Maybe, maybe only partly. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good enough for now. I'm happy to talk to you more uh, separately. Thanks for Yeah, this. and I think, I think another piece of this, if I could add, is that I think there's a big opportunity for utilities outside of financing to look at other ways of, of mobilizing capital. So we're talking about potentially um, like equipment leasing arrangements. So like a heat pump lease program where the, the LDC could do potentially bulk, bulk purchasing and, and be able to lease uh, equipment to to homeowners um, as as a potential way of uh, alternative financing. Well, it's not really financing. It's but it's just a, 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 an alternative way to get get the equipment to market. Mm -hmm. I know, Lauren. Do you want to add anything that I missed? No, or I think maybe, it was maybe great. Maybe, maybe I misrepresented some things too. So. No, you covered it great. I think it was definitely a concern. We wanted to make sure that homeowners didn't just have to deal with one utility for gas measures, another utility for electric measures. Um, this idea of consolidating and bundling was was absolutely critical. Um, so yes, it, Ian already mentioned it, I'll emphasize it. We got confirmation from OEB that there was the ability to do this. And, and Dave, you mentioned Enbridge. Um, they do have their open bill access program, um, but it is largely focused on, on uh, contractors and, and not necessarily the um, energy efficiency um, Type focus. Um, so, anyways, we're going to test this with with um, Oshawa, and and you know if 
for phase one and hopefully that one can span that across the region with others so yeah yeah mm -hmm. so we're, we're our, our other main electric utility lexicon is 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 interested in in implementing this as well but is, is going to take more of a wait and see approach uh in the initial period to see how the the oshawa uh oshawa's program goes Thank you for that. That's why I'm like checking off a lot of the questions that are coming up. I'm like, oh, that was it. That answered that. that is That's that. good because we're running out of time. <laughs> so um, just a few more questions is uh, why was why did you decide to focus on single family homeowners first? Um, well, I mean, Durham region, for those that know it is a, you know, is a uh, does not have a lot of density. I guess might be the way to put it. Um, so, you know, we have, you know, 70 plus percent of our dwellings are single family homes, um, 200,000 single family homes across the region. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, that's, that's really why we chose to focus there. Uh, and as well, we were really gearing our program to be eligible for the community efficiency financing program, which, uh, which in its initial iteration is focused on single family home financing programs. So that's okay. maybe two, a practical to kind of two out uh, two two reasons why why that was our initial focus awesome thank you just i'm just going to get to one more question just based on the time um so uh so this is from Lori. It is, thanks lauren and Ian, for a great presentation i'm taking our pace bylaw to council so this is from uh Lori win um on november 3rd so and great to know other municipalities are charging ahead with this type of program Will you be using certified energy advisors for your energy coaches? And will these folks be brought on as staff with Durham or will you outsource this work? All right, great questions. And congratulations for bringing the PACE bylaw forward. I wonder where you are, Lori. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, interested to see where, how, that, how that goes and wish you success. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, so for our energy coach, um, we are outsourcing it. So we're, we're currently, oh, Alberta, great. Um, uh, um, yeah, so we are planning to hire a third party service provider to, to fulfill that energy coach function. And, and yes, one of the criteria that we're looking at for, for that service provider would be that they, uh, that they have uh, either on staff or a contract relation, contract relationships with certified energy advisors. Um, we're not requiring that, 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 that this coach be the one that delivers the EnerGuide audits. Those audits could be outsourced to other certified energy advisors. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's the answer. And I think to add for, in order to be eligible for the SEF funding too, you do have to have a, a, a registered energy advisor perform an energy evaluate, EnerGuide evaluation um, part of the program. Yeah important piece to, to add. No. So just in the interest of time, I know there are a bunch of questions. Ian has his email on the screen, but if anyone wants to reach out to Lauren as well, feel free to email me and I can connect you with her uh, as a team at Dunsky. I'm happy to do that, um, as long as it's not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's my afternoon. Uh, so thank you again to Ian and Lauren for presenting and, and sharing a lot of information and inspiring other municipalities um, and um, giving them leverage as well to say, hey, others are doing this. We yeah. Should do this. Yeah. Really, really, really happy to, to have the opportunity to share the story and I hope we're successful. So thanks for the invitation. Definitely. Thank, thank you. you. And I will say that this uh, is going to be recorded and we can post it on our, our website as well in, Great. in the future as well to reference. Uh, so Great. just thanks again for joining us. Uh, join me next week. Actually, Corey Diamond's going to be hosting next week. Uh, and we're going to be joined by the Canadian Green Building Council for a chat on industry leadership on building performance, uh, along with a few panelists who will join during question period. So we actually have a representative from Quadreal, TriOvest, and Minto Group. So having these three guests are going to give us uh, insights into a diverse point of view and provide what I expect is going to be a noteworthy discussion period, uh, much like this one was. So again, thanks for joining us and looking forward to seeing everyone next week. Enjoy your weekend. Bye.